thank you very much, Natasha and Angela. That was a great, great presentation. We saw at the reactions that the audience loved it too. But there are also some more questions that I got in here. So the first one that I receive now is, do you recommend rhythm or rate control for atrial fibrillation and hypertensive patients without heart failure? It's a complex one. A complex question. Um, well, for atrial fibrillation, as I explained, it's a self-perpetuating arrhythmia. So for that reason, I would also always choose for rhythm control. Because if you do rate control, you know that the atrium will get damaged and it will be more difficult if a patient, for example, develops heart failure on the end, then, then you cannot do anything anymore. If it comes to rhythm control, we at this present only have one potential cure to treatment modality, and that is, like I explained, pulmonary vein isolation. Uh, that's uh, according to the guidelines now, class one indication. And if you want to give antiarrhythmic drugs, uh, yeah, it, it's more like for the selection which drug to choose. It more depends on the comorbidity of the patients, but also on the age of the patient. Like Cordarone is the most effective drug. Like mm -hmm. you, don't, you don't want to give that to a patient of 30 years old. Right. So it's a little bit of a balance. And the class three antiarrhythmic drugs are very effective as they prolong the reflectory period, like Sotolol, Namiodarona. Flaconite is also a good alternative. So, yeah, but still I would go for rhythm control uh, and not rate control. Mm -hmm. I agree with you. I agree with you. Um, does the prescription of antispecific and hypertension medication bearing on the subsequent development of AF? So, in other words, if I treat hypertension, do I reduce then the risk of AF? Is that more or less what...? Um, yeah, well, there have been some studies where Should they... I be earlier treating? Yeah, That's probably three, underlying again. the question, you know, yes. not wait too long with the hypertension. Yeah, because uh, all the drugs for hypertension, they, had, they, they have an impact on the RAS system. Um, so you also have an impact on the degree of fibrotic tissue. So at least that's one part of the uh, structural remodeling. Uh, it doesn't matter which drug you give, I think, but all the drugs affect that pathway. And there is one study where they actually measured the complexity of electrograms in, in hypertensive patients. And there they saw that if you have hypertension or a lot of fibrotic tissue, the degree of, of, of complex signals is higher. And also in animal models, they show that when you give anti hypertensive treatment, the amount of complex signals reduces. So it seems to have some effect on your structural remodeling and hence also on your electrical activation. So probably the substrate is a high pressure, the heart, blood pressure, the heart has to function, pump harder. That results in left ventricular hypertrophy. If hypertrophy comes, yeah. fibrosis in the ventricle. and It then induces in the atria because exactly. there's wall stretch. Exactly. And there it also but also increased LVEDP probably. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Indeed. So yes. multiple factors, but that all come together by long-standing hypertension and ventricular problems translate in atrial problems. Is yeah. that simply? Uh, it's very simple. I think it's more complex than that. Uh, but yeah, it's it's one uh, poss uh, possible explanation, I would say. I thought you would say that, that I'm not <laughs> thinking too complex. <laughs> <laughs> so another question that I have here, has COVID or long COVID contributed to the pathologies that we saw? In other words, how does COVID, long COVID, relate with atrial abnormalities, atrial fibrillation, etc.? Well, I can imagine that COVID has an impact on atrial fibrillation or at least on the persistence of atrial fibrillation because COVID affects the atrial tissue. I don't think ex it's yet understood how it exactly affects the atrial tissue, but any structural abnormality makes you more prone to atrial fibrillation. And there are indeed reports that patients have more often atrial fibrillation, uh, and more often have atrial fibrillation after an infection. Mm -hmm. uh, we also see that with if you have a pulmonary infection. Oh yeah. And so the same for COVID. And um, probably when you have more damage to the atrial tissue and you already had atrial fibrillation, your episodes will become longer. Right. Important point also. Um, Another question, as part of public health measures, should we teach all persons to measure your blood pressure at young age and frequently thereafter? And if so, what young age? Oh, I think that's a very difficult question. Um, at the young age, yeah, how many hypertensive patients are there, for example, in puberty? There, I think it's not effective. Uh, when you go, uh, get older, of course, you have to check for your risk factors. And uh, same goes for atrial fibrillation. And we all now have wearables where we continuously check our rhythms. And, but at what age, I, I think, is... Uh, 
<laughs> You're a little bit old-fashioned. <laughs> Most people have. Um, and then, uh, they, uh, then you can notice when your heart rate goes up. Um, yeah, but if you get older, your risk, particularly after 60, we know that the, the, the incidence of atrial fibrillation rises. For blood pressure, also, if you, if you have it in your family, then you should start, let's, for example, at the age of 40. But I think that's for each individual at a different moment. Important questions and important answers that you give. Um, the last one about nocturnal arrhythmias and masks or etc. What do you think about that? Um, there is now increasing evidence that the uh, disbalance in this balance in your autonomic uh, nervous system plays an important role. Have you know that if you stimulate your ear, that it reduces uh, the amount of episodes you have. So some people have nocturnal AF; they wake up in the middle of the night and then they have atrial fibrillation. So there seems to be a role for that. But how to treat it at that moment, the, particularly the vagal AF? Yeah, there are some anecdotal, very old studies uh, on diso, uh, disopyramida. Mm -hmm. um, that's yeah. a drug. Um, but yeah, for the rest, we don't have any much knowledge on the topic. So in other words, we know a lot, but also we don't know a lot we don't, yet. Yes, we don't that know enough. For a lot of research, but I think today was a great session. Um, thank you all for the outstanding lectures. And to everyone online joining, our next session will take place on 19 April 2023, 1700 by Dr. Thomas Mengden from Bad Nauheim. I don't know about you, but I had a great time. Yes. I think it was, it was extremely was exciting, wasn't it? It was indeed. It was very nice. <laughs> Thank you all for watching, and we see you the next time, 19 April, Dr. Thomas Mengden, Bad Nauheim in Germany. Thank you. <laughs>